Well, it seemed like an ordinary day. At least as ordinary as it could get if you happen to live in the tropical rainforest in West Africa. It's kind of ordinary at least until a couple of the villagers came running back to the village and they were all excited and just shouting at the top of their lungs, the rebels are coming, the rebels are coming. Well, everybody knew who the rebels were. They had guns, they didn't like the government, they wanted to get rid of the government, but they needed a few things to be able to do that job. One of them happened to be a vehicle, which the missionaries had, one happened to be food, they needed good, clean water. And the missionaries weren't too worried about the rebels coming in because they knew they were going to be there sooner or later. In fact, they were trained how to be able to handle situations like that. They were trained that you're supposed to plan for an evacuation. Well, everybody knew that the rebels lived up north, and so they'd likely be coming from the north. So what the missionaries did is they stockpiled supplies just a few miles south of the village so that they could pick up the diesel fuel for the Land Rover and they could have all of their food and water supplies, everything were all packed up, ready to go so they could get out of, out of the village quickly. The problem is, what did take the missionaries by surprise is those rebels didn't come from the north. They had circled around and they were coming into the village from the south. The missionaries didn't have any supplies that were stocked up north. So let's flash back about 35 years. You see there was a 16 year old kid working in a gas station up in Michigan, just a little bitty gas station way out in farming country. And a semi came coasting down the hill and he coasted in, squeezed in next to the gas pumps. The driver stuck his head out the window. He says, hey kid, do you happen to sell any diesel fuel? Well, of course the kid said no, because it's just a little country gas station. They don't have truckers diesel out in the country. And he said, uh, well, do you sell kerosene? Well, any little country gas station in Michigan at the time would sell kerosene because that's what they used to heat all the milk houses for all of the farmers. And so that nosy kid just happened to follow that trucker around the little gas station and he picked out, he bought some kerosene and he bought some motor oil and he mixed them together and dumped it in his diesel tank and he drove on to the next city. So 35 years later, when I received a frantic satellite phone call from those missionaries in Africa, they were asking me, how do you make diesel fuel out in the jungle? Oh, sure, you drill a well and you get this oil and you make a refinery and you refine it and make diesel fuel, right? Well, wrong. Everybody knows that the little corner store in the village, out in the middle of the jungle, happens to sell lamp oil, which they were using K1 kerosene. And anybody that's a wise missionary always saves their used motor oil when they change the oil in their vehicle. Because they mix that used motor oil with a chemical they can buy in just about any country except the US, it's called 10-1. And they'll mix it with that chemical and they use it to paint on all of the wood in their houses to keep the termites from eating the wood. So I told the missionary, you go down to the corner store and you buy your, your kerosene and then you take a roll of toilet paper and you use it as a filter and you filter that used motor oil and you mix five gallons of kerosene with one, one quart of used motor oil you stir it up real well, dump it in your fuel tank, and you've got diesel fuel. So the missionaries drove out of the jungle. Well, you see, Satan had no intention of allowing those missionaries to get the gospel into that particular village. He was doing everything he possibly could to try to stop them. But we serve an all-powerful God. It's easy for us to realize that these missionaries are living in a war zone, isn't it? They're under constant attack, not just physical attack, but Satan is attacking them from every angle, trying to get them to quit giving the gospel to these people. But one thing that I try to emphasize in our Sunday school class over at Riverview every week is that every single word in this book is put there for our benefit. And I would like to look 
at what Paul was teaching the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 6. You see, when Paul wrote the book of Ephesians to the church at Ephesus, he spent the first three chapters explaining to them what it is that they needed to know to be able to walk with Christ. In the second half of the chapter, the last three book, or chapters, he said what we need to do to be able to walk with Christ. Well, here he's in the very last chapter. So he's summing it all up. So I'd like you to look with me at Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to start with verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. You see, these missionaries are living in a war zone. And one thing I would like to say about Mount Carmel Baptist Church is that you guys have been a tremendous encouragement to a lot of missionaries. And my wife and I have been beneficiaries of some of that uh, with your Christmas dinners and your Thanksgiving dinners for a number of years because we've been on staff now at the Missionary Training Center down here for 45 years. And our job is to help train the missionaries how to handle the physical aspects of living in some really tough situations like some of these in Africa. I grew up in Haiti in the West Indies. My wife grew up in Brazil. And so we have a fair background in a lot of the things that missionaries might expect on the field. And one thing, thing that I noticed when I grew up is that missionaries had a lot of training in how to teach the word and how to get the gospel across to people, but they really lacked in understanding how to manage the physical aspects, the challenges of being able to live there. And so what we do at Off Grid Tech down here on the missionary campus and by the way, I want to thank anybody that was here that uh, has come out to give us a hand on our new building. And it has been such a huge encouragement. And I was telling somebody this morning that we had certain parts of that building that we were responsible to build. That some of the contracts that we chose in order to help cut the cost of the total building. And God sent in just the right number of volunteers at just the right time that we were able to get every single one of our contracts done just in time for the next contractor to come and do his. So we were able to complete every one of our contracts on time. And you know, I can't think of another contract in the whole building that was completed on time. But nobody else had the volunteers that God sent in that were being orchestrated to be able to accomplish that. So I want to thank you for that. And I heard some comments just recently, or yesterday, actually, uh, from some of the little kids that received the Christmas gifts that you guys sent. They thought it was just fantastic that somebody would love them that much from a church that they didn't even know, and they sent gifts in for the kids. And so I wanted to tell you guys thank you for that. But these missionaries are all preparing to go out into the heart of, of these war zones worldwide. But that's not my primary reason to speak with you this morning. What I want to share with you is that every single one of us today are living in a war zone. Satan is not about to let us go about our lives serving the Lord without doing something about it. And I think one of the primary challenges that we have, just like these missionaries in Africa had, is knowing our enemy. Unfortunately, most of us do not know what Satan is all about. And we don't know exactly what he wants, and we don't know his tactics. So we'd like to talk a little bit this morning about what they want. You see, these missionaries knew that the rebels wanted vehicles and water and food. But they also liked hostages because then they could get money for the hostages and trade that in for the other things that they wanted. And the missionaries weren't about to give that to them. Well, Satan has particular 
tactics too. Now sometimes people say, well, I don't think you should talk about Satan. We need to talk about God in the service. Well, Paul was talking about Satan. Why was he doing that? Because Satan used the same tactics back then as Satan is using today to try to stop the gospel. One of the first things that Satan is trying to do is to attack our families. And I think that's one of the frameworks that we can try to draw a picture of. What is it like when Satan is attacking families? Well, let me just give you a little illustration, another one from Africa. Years ago, there were there was a huge campaign going across Africa to try to preserve the ele elephants because everybody was selling them off and uh, or killing off the elephants and, and chopping off their tusks and selling them to rich people worldwide. And so they allowed the population of these elephant herds to get larger and larger and larger and they finally ate up all of the food and so they decided that they were going to relocate these elephants to another place. When they did that, they moved all the mama elephants over and they moved all of the baby elephants over, but they had trouble. They couldn't pick up the papa elephants because they were too big. Their slings weren't heavy enough and their equipment wasn't heavy enough, so they just left the papa elephants there. Well, it wasn't very long after these young elephants had been left without a dad that these young elephants started turning rogue. They found out that they were bigger than all of the other creatures in the jungle, and there wasn't any other creature in the jungle that they couldn't trample. And they'd even go out and use their tusks to gore 2,000 pound rhinos to death. And so these baby elements, or elephants, had to be destroyed because they were killing all of the other animals in the jungle. You see, God designed families to raise families. The same thing with these elephants. They were designed to have parents that would teach them what they should do and what they shouldn't do. And when you destroy that family element, you end up destroying families. Our churches are based on families. God designed us to be able to work as families. Forty-eight years ago, I went to the License Bureau, the courthouse, in uh, Lapeer, Michigan, to get our marriage license. And I went into the office, filled out all of the forms and everything, and the lady behind the counter said, uh, is this your first marriage? I said, yes, it's going to be my last marriage, too. She says, now, don't be so sure. She said, you only have a 50-50 chance of having this be your last marriage. And I thought about that when I was writing down these notes. If you go back to when I was a teenager, even before we got married, three quarters of my classmates still had the original two parents at home. That means a quarter of one out of four of all of the kids in my high school did not have the original two parents at home. A generation later, when our kids were born, 61% of them didn't have the same two parents at home. When our kids went to high school, less than half of all the kids in high school had two parents at home. Do you see the trend that is going to here? Families are falling apart. And Satan is doing everything he can to try to attack the family. Eight times as many babies born today are born out of wedlock than when I was a kid. Eight times as many. So many of them don't have a, fa a, a stable family relationship even from birth. And Satan is doing everything he can to tear that apart. Now I'm not here to talk about gay rights and all of that kind of stuff that's going on today. What I'm talking about is the very specific things that Satan is doing to try to destroy our family. Now yes, there are many things in America today that were against the law when I was a child 
that are now part of the law. It was, you'd be put in jail if you committed an abortion when I was born. You'd be put in jail if you were gambling. You'd be put in jail uh, if you were involved in the whole homosexuality movement. And yet, the government itself is changing. And Satan is doing everything he can. Satan is not just attacking the family. Another one of his tactics is to attack our children. Well, how is he doing that? Well, there are all kinds of things that our kids see in movies, at school, on videos, on their cell phones, all kinds of things that are pretending that Satan does not even exist. I was raised in the country of Haiti, where my folks were missionaries. We lived in a little village way up in the mountains called Guamon. Guamon is just 19 miles from the center of voodooism in the entire world. Now, your mind immediately starts telling you, oh, voodooism is this thing where you stick pins and dolls and stuff like that. Well, voodooism is nothing more than the worship of Satan. And we lived 19 miles from the center of it. And we saw some horrendous things that Satan was doing overseas. I'll give you a few of those examples this morning. But I can't give you all the ones that I know. Because we are in mixed company. But Satan is doing everything he can to try to destroy our children. Well, how is that coming into America? Well, it is very, very fast. Uh, just recently, I was reading an article about the whole Harry Potter movement. Now, most of us have heard, well, Harry Potter is just a fairy tale, and, and they tell all of this. Well, let me read to you just a small little caption. It says, Harry Potter is the creation of a former UK English teacher who promotes witchcraft and Satanism. Harry is a 13-year-old wizard. Her creation openly blasphemes Jesus and God and promotes sorcery, seeking revenge upon anyone who upsets them by giving you examples. And she even lists the sources and the authors and the titles so that you can go put hexes and curses on people. And she gives spells and rituals and how to use demonic powers. And Somebody didn't believe this, so they had, anybody familiar with a website called Snopes.com, S-N-O-P-E-S? It's a website that is used, you know when you get all of this kind of junk mail on your phone, it'll tell you that the government passed a bill about such and such, and you think that it's probably all lies? Well, you can go to Snopes.com, and they'll give you the history of this email that just was sent to you, it's actually been around 15 years that people have been propagating this lie. And I used to really respect Snopes until I read what they had to say about this Harry Potter thing. Because Snopes claimed that it was only the parents who didn't believe Harry Potter stuff was all a myth. Snopes says the kids are smarter than the parents because they know that Satan isn't real. Well, Satan is real. But one of his primary tactics is to try to get you and me and our children and our families to believe that Satan doesn't even exist. Well, let me tell you, he does exist. And here, Paul is teaching us to know our enemy. We need to know his tactics. And it says... In verse 10, take a stand against the devil's schemes. And what are the devil's schemes? Well, if you think all the way back to our first introduction in the Bible to Satan, we're way back in the beginning of Genesis. Uh, he came to Adam and Eve, and to Eve first, and he didn't really say that everything that God told you was wrong, did he? He tried to take what God said and change it just a little bit. Did God really say such and such? Well, this is what he really meant. And Satan's schemes are still the same today. Same thing if we use the illustration of the Harry Potter thing. 
it's a fairy tale. It's not a true book, a true story that was written about Harry Potter. But Satan is using what is being taught in that to teach our children that Satan doesn't even exist. There was a number of testimonials that I've read from nine and ten-year-old kids that have read the Harry Potter books, and the parents think, oh, that's great. They're, all, they're reading now. They like to read now. So we'll give them all the whole Harry Potter series. It's the most popular book series in the world, the last I heard. And it's filling the kids' minds with, the, with things like Harry Potter is much stronger than Jesus. Harry Potter can get whatever he wants. All he has to do is do a hex on somebody. Jesus was weak, and that's why Jesus died on the cross. So I don't believe in Jesus anymore. I'm going to believe in what Harry Potter says, and I'm going to learn how to do spells and chants and things like that. And it is undermining the faith of our children because Satan is doing everything he can to steer them aside just a little bit at a time. Well, you see, hexes and curses really do exist. When I was in Haiti, the president of the country decided that he was going to come and visit all of his entire country. He had never visited his country before. Transportation was really rough in those days. There was only one road that goes from the south of the country where the president lived up to the northern part of the country where we lived. And that, mo that road it took four-wheel drive to be able to get through it. And the president got his whole motorcade. They spent months repairing the road enough so that his motorcade could get the vehicles up to the northern part of his country. And they announced this big time when the president's motorcade was supposed to come through so all the people would line the streets and cheer and all of this kind of good stuff. And there was a local witch doctor that lived just a little bit south of where we lived. And uh, he lived near a village called Gonaive. And this witch doctor decided he was going to paint a yellow stripe across the road. Now, witch doctors are the same, really, as a voodoo priest. They are the leaders of those worshiping Satan. And they have regular meetings and, and ceremonies and all of this type of stuff. But... This witch doctor painted a yellow line across the road, the dirt road, and he let it be known that if the president crosses that yellow line, he shall surely die. Well, this president spent a day and a half driving all the way on these terrible roads, and he got up to that yellow line, and all the local people stopped him and told him what the witch doctor said. And the president promptly turned around and went back to the Capitol. Why? Because... This president was using other voodoo priests at the Capitol who could inform him through the power of Satan when Cuba was invading various parts of his country. And he knew through the power of Satan. Why? Satan can't tell the future, but he can tell what's going on right now. And these voodoo priests would come and let the president know, and he would have troops waiting for them. And eventually Cuba got the idea that there's no way we're going to be able to invade Haiti. They always know. They must have pretty good intelligence uh -huh, about where we're going to be, and they always have troops on the ground waiting to mow us down. You see, hexes are real. It's not something we should be messing with. Cost casting spells on people are not something that we should be messing with. And Paul is warning, that, warning us against that here. And we might think, well, that's just overseas stuff. Satanism isn't in America. Satanism is not bothering America. That's false. We now have two huge organizations in America. One of them is the Church of Satan, and another one is a satanic temple. And these have tens of thousands of satanic followers living in America today. Some of these satanic worshiping people in America said that, okay, in our courthouses around America, it's legal for them to put up the Ten Commandments. Well, we don't believe the Ten Commandments, uh, so we would like to put up our shrine. They call that the Christian shrine, and so we're going to put up our own shrine. 
So what they decided to do was make a statue. And they would put up an image of this statue in all of the courthouses. Here's a description of that statue. A winged creature with the torso of a man, the head of a goat with horns, and he sits on a throne beneath a pentagram, a five-sided symbol of Satan, two fingers sagely raised as two children are standing on around staring at the statue in awe. And they actually built this statue, and it has now been unveiled in the city of Detroit. And they want to put this in all the courthouses. Now, this is real. It's a real threat. There are a number of uh, congresses, legislatures in various states around the United States that are now currently passing laws against putting this image of Satan worship in the courthouses because it is a real threat. You see, the country of Haiti was dedicated to Satan when it was founded, and I honestly believe that's one of the reasons why Haiti has never been able to come out of poverty. In Haiti, I told you I'd tell you a little bit more about the pentagrams. Uh, witch doctors will often take cornmeal and they will make figures on the ground. They'll usually start with, now this is only in their voodoo worshiping ceremonies, and they'll make figures on the ground and in that figure they'll put parts of the image like the goat head and the horns and the things like uh, of the, the winged torso of a man and things like that in it and other symbols for worshiping Satan. There's a little boy in our village when I was a, just a child, I was probably 10 years old, and this little boy's name was Giselle, and he was about the same age as I was, but nobody really knew for sure his age. But Giselle was in one of the evening worship services that we had right next to our house, and he accepted Christ as his personal savior. Well, the Bible tells us that as soon as we accept Christ as our savior, our body is indwelt with the Holy Spirit, right? Well, Giselle's mom and dad had died a number of years before, and he was living with his aunt and uncle. His uncle happened to be a voodoo priest. And when Giselle was walking home that night, the voodoo priest, his uncle, happened to be having a pentagram on the ground in his village, and they were having a Satan worshiping ceremony. I could tell you a lot about those ceremonies because they used to have them right across the gate from our house in the village. And they would go on for two weeks straight sometimes. And we'd sit up on top of the roof at, at night and just watch what was going on. But the witch doctor, his uncle, was doing these Satan worshiping ceremonies and something very, very strange happened. He felt the, president, the presence of the Holy Spirit long before Giselle even entered the village. He knew that it was Giselle when Giselle came in because he could feel the power of the Holy Spirit, which is far more powerful than the presence of Satan. And so much so that he totally stopped this ceremony and he kicked Giselle out of his house because he knew he could no longer have future ceremonies to worship Satan. And so Giselle came and lived with us. We added a little room onto our house, and that's where Giselle lived, and he worked for us. So these hexes are real. And when the presence of the Holy Spirit comes in, it makes a huge difference. So we are told that we need to know our enemy we are to know what they want. You see, these missionaries knew exactly what their enemy was looking for, and we are to know their tactics. Verse 11 says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take a stand against the devil's schemes. You see, we aren't supposed to just sit passively by and do nothing about it when Satan com Satanism comes in or when the kids are reading books about Satan at school, or when our kids are scanning through the internet or 
We are not to let them just take their phones and look up anything that they want to because they can get very deeply involved in what Satan is trying to do to take over the minds and souls of our kids. We are to take a stand. In fact, four times in this one little passage here, remember I said the second half of the book of Ephesians is to tell them what to do? Well, four times Paul is telling us what to do here. He says, take a stand. We're not just to sit passively by and do nothing. So how is it that we take a stand? We need to know what our kids are doing. We need to know the friends that they have. We need to know if they're out playing Satan-worshiping games. And there's a lot of Satan-worshiping games out there. And a lot of video games that have to do with demons and witchcraft. There are thousands of TV programs. I was looking somewhere lately through, what was that, Amazon Prime had a menu that you could scroll through, and you just look through all of the popular movies. It's about demons, and it's about demon possession, and it's about demonic rituals, and witchcraft, and casting spells, and how to control people. And these are the popular movies that our kids are watching today. So we need to really watch that. We need to be very, very careful because Satan is the one instigating this. But we also need to know our resources. And in verse 13, Paul explains to us very carefully the resources. He says, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all of the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. You see, we have the resources that we need to take a stand. He talks about truth. You know, the Bible tells us that Satan is the father of lies. And I'll give you a few illustrations of that in a moment. But the same is true back then as it is today. We have tens of thousands of people in America who are following Satan on purpose, knowingly, today. But if you look at their websites or if you attend one of their so-called churches, they will tell you, now get this, here they are worshiping Satan, they're doing satanic rituals, they have satanic shrines all around their churches, and they'll tell you that Satan doesn't exist. Now you talk about the father of lies. It's called a satanic temple, but Satan doesn't exist. It's called the church of Satan, but Satan doesn't exist. He does, but he denies it. And so our kids, they get into that. They, oh, well, Satan doesn't really exist. We just get power from this. And they deny his existence. Well, what better way to fight somebody if... <laughs> The Bible tells us that we are supposed to know their tactics. We are supposed to know how to defend against them. It's kind of interesting. The Bible tells us in Ezekiel that, uh, and I know some of our Sunday school classes are studying part of this right now, but our news media doesn't really want us to know what's going on in the world. But Israel is being attacked just about every week, primarily by Iran. They're bringing in missiles from North Korea, and they're putting them in Syria, and they're putting their GPS guidance systems on them, and they're firing them at Israel. And our news media, how many times have you heard that from the news media lately? Well, there was a big attack uh, coming out of Syria. And so Israel knew all about this. They knew their enemy. They knew their GPS guidance systems. And so they went in there, <laughs> and after they fired these missiles at Israel, Israel reprogrammed the GPS guidance systems on them, and these missiles circled around and went right back to where they came from. <laughs> you see, they know their enemy. We are supposed to be that wise. And people say, well, you shouldn't talk about Satan. Yes, we should. 
We need to know our enemy and how to fight him. No, we're not trying to glorify Satan. God is all-powerful, and that's what he starts off with in the very first verse here. We serve an awesome God. He has all power. And yet, we know that we have truth. We know that we have righteousness. Satan is everything but the truth. Anything that you hear, that you read on these various... By the way, I was doing a lot of research for this message this last week. Our computer at home has very poor internet access. And so I went over to my office over at the training center. They have very high speed, extremely reliable. My computer in my office never crashes, except when I was doing the research on this message. It crashed 12 times. Because I really believe Satan is out to stop this message anywhere he possibly can. And so I just rebooted the computer, start back up. It's never failed on anything else. I was researching all kinds of stuff on construction this week. It never failed at all. But Satan does not like the shield of faith. Why? Because faith is far more powerful than Satan will ever be. And that's simply faith that we have in what Christ did for us on the cross. And the, the purpose of the, this shield of faith is so that you can extinguish all of the flaming arrows. What are the flaming arrows? It's attacks by Satan. Satan is attacking from every direction he can, every chance he gets. We can choose to ignore him, or we can choose to use the shield of faith for God's protection. And we need to teach our kids the same thing. It's real, and it needs a real defense. We can take up the helmet of salvation. And by the way, if you don't have the helmet of salvation, you can't take up any of the rest of these. You can't use your defenses that God is offering to fight Satan if you don't have the helmet of salvation. And we can take up the sword of the Spirit. What is the sword of the Spirit? I hope everybody knows. We have the sword of the Spirit, and that's what we are told to take up. And it says right here, in case you forgot, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Pretty clear. So we are to keep our nose in the Word. We are to be studying out the Scripture every day. And if you don't have time for that, I asked a friend of mine back about 20 years ago, I said, you know, it's really good for us to study every day, but I get up in the morning and I'm busy every single minute. At, at that time, I was handling questions from 100 different missionaries all at the same time on tech questions that they were needing help with on the various mission fields. And I would work uh, all day long handling all of the construction and maintenance of the school, and I'd work late into the evening answering more emails and trying to write a book to help missionaries understand technical stuff. And I, I asked this friend of mine, I said, how do you ever spend time like that in the Word? And he said, uh, do, you, do you have an alarm clock? <laughs> I said, yes. He said, set it earlier. And so I did. And I've been getting up at 20 after 5 just about most every day since then. My wife doesn't like to get up quite that early. She studies after I leave in the morning. But, but uh, you do have an alarm clock. And even if you are totally swamped working too many hours a day, believe me, it'll get your day off to a whole lot better start if you can keep your nose in the Word first. And then Point number three, we need to implement our plan. Well, we can have a plan, just like these missionaries. They needed to implement their plan. It didn't go exactly the way that they had planned. But in the scripture, he gives us a very clear path here in verse 18. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. You see, this plan is started with prayer. That's how you get the plan rolling. When do you pray? Every day, all the time, for all the requests, for all the people. Now, lately, I don't know why. Maybe it's just because I'm getting old. But lately, I've been waking up every morning at 3 o'clock. 
And I don't get up and read my Bible then, but I found that that is a tremendous time to pray. So if you ever have insomnia, just think about it. Maybe it's God waking you up so you can pray. So I've been making a long list of prayer requests, and I'll remember, okay, there's seven major things on that prayer list, and I only prayed for six of them. Lord, help me remember what the seventh one is, and he'll do it. And we need to pray every day, but he says pray in the Spirit. You see, it's not us, it's not our power that is going to be able to fight the tactics of Satan. It's God's power. We serve an infinite God. He is all-powerful. I love the songs that were picked out this morning because it's talking about we are serving an all-powerful God and he is worthy to be praised. And we need to spend time in the word. We need to spend time in prayer. And it's not just because that's what good Christians are supposed to do. We need to do that to be able to withstand these fiery darts coming from Satan, these attacks coming from Satan. We've only talked about two or three of these attacks this morning. There are many of them. He will try everything he can to try to discourage you. He'll try everything he can to try to start up an argument with you and somebody else that will destroy your relationship, especially with other believers. It might be in the church. I can't imagine that everything is always perfect at Mount Calvary. Maybe there's somebody else that you disagree with in the church. Maybe it's a contract that you have with somebody and it didn't work out just exactly the way that you had planned. Satan can use anything to try to destroy the path of you walking with the Lord. Because that's what Paul is talking about in this whole book of Ephesians. We are to have that sweet, intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to spend time in the Word and time in prayer so that we get to know what the Lord wants in our life. So we need to stay in contact with the Lord. We need to keep our nose in the Word with daily devotions. And we need to pray in the Spirit. Paul says, put on the full armor of God, but you know... As we already alluded to, you can't put on the full armor of God if you're not a born-again believer. If you have not put your faith in what Christ did on the cross in payment for your sin, you have no defense against Satan. There was a time when we were up in the village in Goman in Haiti, and there was an American who was working on his doctorate, I believe it was, and he came through our village and he wanted to know how voodooism worked. Where do they get this power? How did they do these things that they were doing? My dad knew that this man was not, obviously, a born-again believer. And this man was in a dangerous place for somebody that was, did not have the Holy Spirit to defend them. And my dad warned him you need to turn around now and go back to the United States. And he wouldn't do it. Dad urged him several times, and Dad would not help him meet any of the people that could give him the information that he wanted. So this man kept on going, looking for somebody else that would help him understand, really, the study of Satan. Six months later, four men carried this man on a stretcher back through our village, headed back to the United States. And the man was totally insane. You see, the demon possession that Jesus talked about, remember a number of times where Jesus cast out demons? That's still happening a lot overseas. And it is going to be happening in America today as people turn their lives over more and more to Satan. Once Satan takes possession of their life, they have no more control of it. And so if we have not accepted Christ as our own personal, uh, our own personal Savior, we do not have the Holy Spirit inside of us and we have no defense against Satan. And yet we are living on a battlefield. 
we are living in a war zone. And so, please, if you have not accepted Christ as your Savior, we would be glad to speak with you after the service. We would ask you to come forward as we sing. We'll be glad to share with you what it means to put your faith in Christ and what it means to accept Christ as your own personal Savior. So please stand with us as we sing.